So I want to welcome you guys to In Joku's Pants. This is a talk show. Uh, it's a very esteemed talk show. They've been writing about it in um, the New York's Time magazine a couple of times now. So you've probably heard about it. And uh, I'm honored to have my guest, Joey Palladino, here in the studio, who will soon... Right now, he's not in Joku's pants, but by the end of this episode, he'll have his own uh, Joku's pants to have on his legs that I'll have him in. What's going on, Dragon Ballers? I'm very excited to get in Joku's pants. Yes! <laughs> yes! What an amazing en entryway video. All right, so I'm, we have so much stuff to talk about, and I'm so excited to talk about all this stuff, but... The first things first is we got to get these pants on the roll. So right. these are these are all fabrics that I've designed over here. Um, you can take a look through whatever looks like you want to wear it on your body. I can even help you over here kind of, we can like wrench this this way. And you can... I'm thinking something one piece because I have so much Dragon Ball paraphernalia. All so right, all right, yeah. I'm thinking something a, one piece. I have like a red and black luffy fabric and i think i might have a zoro fabric that's demon slayer this is all dragon ball i did just make a uh supreme kai of time fabric this is my cousins like that show this is all dragon ball dragon ball dragon ball this from this uh from the manga oh yep yep dragon ball this is one piece Nice, nice. Got some Luffy there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Put that on the end. Since we're talking about One Piece from time to time. Oh, this one's pretty cool. This oh, that is, like is pretty sick. King of the Pirates kind of look. That's definitely in contention. All right, all right. I just want to see a Zoro one and then... Yeah, I think I have a Zoro one. This is my Kai fabric. I just made that one. Oh, nice. Right off the secret rare. That's dope. Yeah, it's... Uh, gets rid of Venus. Captain Falcon. Pants. Yeah, that's, I'm really into Captain Falcon. If I haven't mentioned that three or four times already, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is some of the manga, some more Captain Falcon. I don't know if the Zoro one still exists. It may have gotten turned into pants already. Oh, I missed the pants train on that one. Yeah, that's all right. You know, oh, the yeah. Popo one. Actually, you know what? Let's do the Popo one. I like that one. Yeah. All right. Cool. Let's okay, do that. Cool. Let's do it. Do you want? Pants? Do you want shorts? Do you want capris? Probably shorts. Shorts? Yeah, probably I shorts. feel like shorts you'll probably get. With the C E at the end, not with the S. Yes. At the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shorts spelled S H O R T C E. Very important. Thanks for remembering. Sounds cool to me. And reminding all of our viewers that are the millions, the hundreds of thousands of millions of people that are going to see the first episode of In Joku's Pants. You know, I did a series called In Lil Joe's Pants. Previously, I was Lil Joe, but after I quit playing Marvel Contest of Champions, I had to grow up, so I graduated to Joku. Uh, good thing you're not Big Joe, that's my trademark nickname. Oh, good. Well, that would seem we're all Joes in here, I guess. Especially, and the guy that's doing all the video, video work, his name's Joe also, weirdly enough. Interesting, that's not how I was introduced to him, but Joe I, Steve. I couldn't get him to say anything. <clears throat> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so next I just gotta find this pattern. So, um... Definitely interested to see how you do this, because I had not the first clue of how to make clothes. You know, I started making clothes when I was very young. As I told you when we were hanging out, one of the first things I started making were hats when I was very young. Um, I just never really... I just never really liked all the things that I found in stores, and I was like, I feel like I could make this more interesting myself. Um, so... I, uh, I started just making things. I used to, uh, you know, I was telling you I used to be really into Marvel comics when I was a kid. One of the first things I used to do is I used to take a Sharpie and draw Marvel comic characters on, um, on t-shirts. And then I would take that t-shirt fabric and I would sew it on to bandanas. I used to really like bandanas, which you can see has changed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I used to draw Marvel characters and then sew them onto things. And I think a lot of that actually came from <clears throat> the question you asked me before we were recording this was what's my, you know, ethnic background. So my mom is from, uh, my mom's from India and my dad's Jewish and my mom's Hindu 
And to be Hindu, your dad's supposed to be Hindu. And to be Jewish, your mom's supposed to be Jewish. Oh, that's backwards. <laughs> yes. Interesting. And my dad has the job that a typical Jewish or Indian man has, and he's Jewish. He's a Sanskrit professor and a history of religions professor, retired now, but still, you know, writes and stuff. And my mom is a dentist, which is, you know, a typical Jewish man's job. Um, so when I was like growing up, you know, you know, there's that point in time in school where like people are like, oh, I'm going to church this weekend, or I'm going to like Hebrew school or whatever, and, and everybody's like identifying with this thing. I had like nothing to really identify with. I was like, I don't really know. I used to go by calling myself uh, whatever, because I saw that in a Sesame Street show, and I was like, yeah, I could be a whatever, that seems easy enough. But, um... The only, like, I didn't really have, like, the, I guess the thing that religion offers for, you know, younger people is, like, the basis for a moral compass at a young age, right? It's like, here are these stories about these things, like, you know, your faith can give you some direction on, like, how to deal with these ethical situations that you don't, maybe aren't so equipped to deal with. You were mentioning that you're, you kind of have, faith has a strong role in your... Yeah. Life. Yeah, I definitely, I grew up Catholic, and I would say I still, uh... Not exactly to the T of the church, but I would say it still plays a role in my life. Yeah, I mean, there's there's things of value in the stories that are, you know, you learn that are, are helpful to kind of direct you when you're making some decisions, either just about like how to interact with people or, you know, things to think, whatever. So, you know, the, one of the things that's been in my life for a really long time actually is Dragon Ball. And Dragon Ball sort of became like my Bible in a way. You know, I used to, I started, re I, I started watching Dragon Ball when I was a kid, but I started reading Dragon Ball um, in college and I've read Dragon Ball pretty much every year for the last 10 years. And every time I read it, there's different things that stick out to me that are very interesting that have a lot of um, parallels to things in other religions. Mm. It's weird. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think fiction is like a, like you were saying with religion like it's a good teacher like you know moral compass like uh, I remember like watching Naruto young that was one of the first animes I saw like when I was young and I was like wow this kid is just like he always wants to do the right thing you know he grew up a little rambunctious but he always just wants to do the right thing and that was uh, really cool like I, like I do gra I do grab some things in my life from faith but also like fiction is like one of the biggest driving f forces in my life for sure yeah and it really can be and like the right thing also like that's a that's a that's not always a clear answer right like there's so many different things that like a situation can have multiple right answers but sometimes when you have these characters that you look up to and you're like man that guy's cool that guy's doing cool stuff and i like like how he's interacting with the people around them it gives you something you can model yourself on because that's how like humans have moved forward is like they can see what other things happened and they can create models for themselves, right? Like everything in science is like a diagram. And it's like, re here's some text. Now like refer back to diagram 13.4 and you can see that the ATP synthase produces, my, you know, from the, in the mitochondria or whatever. Yes, like, like, of the cell. Yeah, 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 that's right. Oh, I do have Zoro pockets. Do those go on pants? Oh, oh dude, you need oh. pockets for sure all right let's do it that's, that's, sure. i'm cool with that a little dragon ball cool. one piece cool. uh, amalgamation yeah yeah mixing it up um but i i guess uh i feel like a valid question would be um how did dragon ball get into your life yeah it's definitely one that i watched a lot growing up like i i still remember it's it's really funny um you know watching the episodes where where Goku is turning into a Super Saiyan and it takes like 18 episodes just for him to get to that level and <laughs> yeah. you're just waiting every week like, man, is this like ever going to be done? But it was still super hype just watching him scream for episodes and episodes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's something I grew up on, you know. Uh, the card game itself is a bit different. Like I played card games my whole life. I played Yu-Gi-Oh! since I was really young. And it's funny because like once I got to like middle school, high school, I, mem I remember my cousins like, you know, kind of making fun of me a little bit. They're saying, when are you going to grow out of this? When are you gonna... I was like, I just, I like it. I like playing card games. It's fun. And then eventually I found out about competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! And long story short, not a huge fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! anymore. Um, Dragon Ball card game came around. I loved the anime as a kid and uh, the game's great. The game's awesome to play. Yeah, and it's cool, especially for a fan, like how much of the, how much of the story is represented in the game. Like how you can play through archetypes and it's like, whoa, like I feel like I'm Gohan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to... Oh, waste me? Yeah, I'm gonna need to give you a hug. Wait, what you mean to do? Just like this? Uh, T-pose? Just a little close to you because my shoulder doesn't go up. 
How's like that tightness? This is over your shirt. This stretches a little bit? Yeah. That's cool. Tighter, looser? I think that's good. pretty good, yeah. Yeah? Alright. Excellent. I have to waste it. With a little bit of, with a little bit of stretch, should be good. Yeah, I can always make it tighter also. Maybe. Um Yeah, I uh What were we talking about? Dragon Ball is my religion. Dragon Ball. Goku. It's cool, actually. I really like, oh, we, you know, upstairs we were talking a little bit about, like, the sequence of events that happened in Dragon Ball. And one of the reasons why I think Dragon Ball Super is so cool is because it really started creating, like, a structure to the universe. Yeah. You know, like, we have these gods of destruction and angels and, like, how the universes work together. And I think it was a really cool decision to do, like, Dragon Ball, um, what was the one that came out for, like, PlayStation and stuff? Xenoverse. Xenoverse. Yeah. yeah, where they started introducing some hero, some hero stuff. Yeah, yeah, I like how Xenoverse was done because it kind of made a bridge point for like all the things that don't quite line up. Yeah. Um, and in a way, like kind of makes everything canon, sort of. Yeah, Xenoverse is where I was like first introduced to anything heroes related. Like I did not even know what heroes was. But I learned like what Mira and Toa were from here from uh, from Xenoverse. Right, they were in Z were they in Heroes before Xenoverse? To be honest, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just uh. So I think, he so Dragon Ball Heroes just had its tenth anniversary, which means it's twenty twenty one. So that was two thousand eleven that Dragon Ball Heroes started. Yeah, Xenoverse one might have been right around then. 2011, 2012, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I was in college when I played the first one. I remember. I didn't play many video games back then. Uh, this machine is called the Serger. It cuts. Is that the actual name or is that your name for it? No, no, that's the, yeah, that's the actual name. Oh, okay, this is cool. Serge. This is Serge. Sur sur this is my Serge Awakening machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, what uh, what are your favorite parts about the Dragon Ball Super card game? Fair parts. Uh, I love. I mean, I, I I'm obviously biased, but I think it's like the best mechanical game on the market because every every card in your hand is usable because of the combo mechanic. I think that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Obviously, except for extra cards or 10k combos, whatever. But for the most part, they're all usable. I really love how the game like draws a lot because every deck can can meet its game plan essentially. Like your decks are very consistent, which means that you can play your deck. It's just a matter of you know what deck you choose and how you choose to play it. Um, as opposed to like Yu-Gi-Oh, for example, which is the background I come from with card games, where uh, if you have a brick opening hand, you kind of just like can't play the game. Yeah, one of my, actually Johnny was saying that, he was basically saying like you in Dragon Ball, like you can play your way out yeah. of a brick draw. Yeah. Which, um, which I, I, I definitely found that to be true. And um, I also like, like when I, when I talk about DBS to people, I kind of, you were saying you play Super Smash Brothers from time to time. Pretty casually, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you, do, I'm yeah. sure you've played like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. Yeah. More more people have played, you know, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, so they know that they can relate, you know, those games to things. But I feel like Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, they all are a little more like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter, where Dragon Ball is a little bit more like Super Smash Brothers. Mm -hmm. In the sense that... In the sense that um, it's it's more combo centric like if you're gonna get comboed it's not like you're getting comboed into a wall and you can't get out of it and there's nothing you can do right it's more like you can pivot and turn in your combos more specifically based on the percentage that your opponent's at yeah there, there's, there's definitely a thing in game theory and i play league of legends too so like this also relates to this if anyone watching knows about league of legends but in league of legends for example or even Yu-Gi-Oh and sometimes magic like when you fall behind, it's almost impossible to come back because your opponent's just amassing like a massive resource lead over you. But in Dragon Ball, because we draw so much and because the life system works the way it does, like when you take a beating, you gain cards. Um, it, it's really possible to like mount a comeback, which is really nice. Also the awakening mechanic. Yeah. The fact that the awakening mechanic exists gives you incentive to get to a certain place, right? Like yep. the way that in, um, in Super Smash Brothers, like, certain combos work at certain percentages. Like you can't do certain combos once you're over certain percentages and you can't do certain combos when you're under certain percentages because the characters have specific physics that relate to the percentage that they're at. And so, you know, a combo at 70% 
is not going to work the same as a combo at 30%. And that combo is also going to be relative to the size of the character, their hitboxes, all those things where it's similar in Dragon Ball, right? Like, I'm going to hit somebody very differently at 5 than I'm going to hit them at 6. Right, right. Right? Like, I would way rather go 5 to 3 than 6 to 4. Right, right. And, uh, and I think that's interesting to have that kind of idea of like where do I want my opponent in their life and what's it going to give them access to and the other thing I think that's really cool like with evolution booster and um some of the super combos from unison warrior is like there's now accessibility at five right like five was a place where I I would want to put my opponent and keep them but now there's a way to go from five to four and protect your unison with, yeah. with the evolution booster negates which I think are, are so cool I think they added a lot to the game and it and it's I think uh, another thing that's like for people to kind of, they get um, like with the upcoming ban list, right? Like there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm going to quit the game if this, this, and this get banned. And sure, like I can get being bummed out if you made an investment into something and then, okay, now guess what? This thing is getting banned. But the things that are getting changed, like they don't, they don't make the changes to make the game less playable. They make the changes to make the game more playable. Right. Um, and I think that it's, it's cool to entertain healthy mechanics and create more de more space for the future design of the game in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the banless goal yeah, obviously should be to, like, make the game more fun, more enjoyable, because, like, um, you, can't, you can't just, like, only cater to the competitive players, but at the same time, like, the highest level of play, you get to see the most broken strategies. Right. Um, that's that's generally what the most competitive players are striving for. So in a way, like you really do want to take a look at the competitive scene and see like, okay, these strategies are a bit too strong. Um, and with the spirit boost stuff, I love it. Uh, it looks really cool coming out of set 14, but compared to what we have now, in terms of like things being super free, like Mecha King Piccolo, Vegex, right. Dark Broly, um, spirit boost looks like quote unquote over costed, where it's not necessarily over costed, but if the free stuff still lives, then Spirit Boost is going to look a lot less appealing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think uh, the, it's not even just the amount of free play, but the nature of the free play. I think that creates a lot of issues in that, like, you're, right? Like, okay, if Dark Broly was just playing bodies on board that were free, like, yeah, it would be annoying and it would be something to deal with. But the fact that it's pressuring your hand, it's pressuring your board, and it's protecting its leader like those three access points for each of the three three plays like that's a little crazy you know right. the fact that king piccolo is gonna free play a blocker that has barrier that's also gonna neg something and doesn't it ignore barrier when it negs i don't think so no, no but it's still definitely. really interruptive yeah yeah, yeah very interruptive definitely um so i think the nature of the free play is is more the issue than the free play itself i think if free play were available but it weren't so utility based, it would be something that they wouldn't have to power creep as much. Yeah, I agree. And it's actually interesting because the nature of the game, like the nature of the game is pretty aggressive because like there's no summoning sickness, for instance. Um, so like anything you can play for free can instantly become an attacker, which usually is gonna lend to aggro. Like maybe they could put a clause, like if you free play this card, you can't attack with it for the turn or something. Like okay. Belmod, for example, like, Belmod comes in, pops a guy, and it's a, and it's a blocker. Right. But it's also 20k, so like it's a big attacker. Right. So maybe it would have been a good clause for Belmod to be like, oh, you can't attack with this card the turn you play it. Uh, it's meant to be like, uh, you know, a removal and a block. Yeah, and at the same time, I do like that they give you the option because then you have to decide, like, am I going to keep this up and block with it, or am I going to push? Right. Um, but, you know, in a deck like Dark Broly, like, yeah, of course you're going to push. Yeah, like a lot of times pushing is just like the right call. Yeah. Um, and, and there's times where it's not, that's true, but... Uh, coming, coming from a blue player, I find that more often than not, it's not the right call. Yeah, blue definitely has a slower play style. On that note, actually, you know, I know we were talking about this earlier, but the, the tapion, is it tapion or tapion? I say tapion, but I'm not sure how the localization, to be honest. We'll, we'll say tapion, yeah. for argument's sake. Um, I think that the Tapion Unison, I think is, is really, really good. And I think it's really cool how it's designed for Spirit Boost. I know, you know, it's direct competitor is definitely going to be the Baby Unison and mm -hmm. Baby Unison is great, 
the fact that you can plus two and draw is just so strong. And if we see the format move to a more mid-range um, place, that's going to be so, so valuable, right? Like yeah. the, 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 the Piccolo Jr. unison is so busted because it comes out for two draws and then, you know, it's adding markers off other effects and you're, yeah. you know, just killing things when people counter. That card needs to get addressed. I could see it. I could, I, I wouldn't like it to be banned, but I think the 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 auto being once per turn would be nice. I think that yeah, I think that would be yeah, even maybe once per game, like every time somebody counters to just have something on the board, it's pretty pretty strong. Yeah, it, it definitely is really strong. I, I I actually really like how unisons are starting to draw. Like it, it feels really nice to just be able to keep your hand size up because yeah. one of the issues of the game is like if you do fall too far behind in hand size, uh, you're you're in a really really bad spot. And a lot of times that comes down to like playing correctly. You can avoid that situation, but in other times, sometimes you can't really help it. It kind of depends. Yeah, I think I think hand size definitely wins the game. Yeah, generally yeah. Unless you have like some some really weird combo like I don't know, catastrophic blow or like. Uh, Android 17 turning the tide, like those can kind of ignore hand size, but um, yeah, there's some uh, there's some instances where I, I do like the fact that Unison's draw, but maybe it's a bit too busted. Yeah, no, I I like it. I think you know I am an artist. I have a bachelor's degree in art, and uh, I really enjoy drawing pictures. So when I get to draw cards, it's a lot faster than the amount of time it takes to draw a picture, and I get a beautiful picture in my hand. True, it's like instantaneous drawing. Yeah, instantaneous drawing, and the amount of value that I get for that is like, you know, I feel like in a lot of these things you have to really focus on the, the inherent value of the things that you're doing, and there's so much value in these cards. Not only are they valuable themselves, but they're gorgeous. The art is just so cool. Like, the, is there any other card game that looks this good? No, nah, no shot. Right. Dragon, Ball, Dragon Ball is definitely the best art card yeah. game. No shot. And even, you know, like, I was I was very much on the Heroes train, and I think Dragon Ball Heroes cards are beautiful. Yeah, definitely. But there's so much shattered glass that I it hurts my eyeballs. <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember how easily I cry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, when I look at uh, Dragon Ball Heroes cards, you know, I really can do a number on my eyes. And they, I'm so glad that they moved to Wave Foil. And that, I don't know if they would have made that decision if the community didn't speak up. I feel like there was a, a real voice in the community of people like, stop the whole Shattered Glass thing. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people wanted to move away from that, which is cool. Like, it's actually funny because Yu-Gi-Oh has been out for 20 plus years. And I was in there um, in like the, the 12 to 15 year span. Like, I haven't played the past couple years, but... Uh -huh. Um, early Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, they also used to do, like a shatter foiling and uh, these, these weird like dot foiling. So I guess every card game just kind of goes through it until they, until they realize like this is not worth the trouble. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely ways to use shatter glass to make it look really cool. But like the thing I think in foiling technique is like when you do, you know, are you familiar with what like reverse foiling is? Uh, as far as Pokemon, sort of, a little bit. It's, it's basically like, I mean, we have it in all the parallel foils in Dragon Ball are reverse hollow foil. So it's when hollow foil is blocked out. Because the hollow foil, the card itself, the card stock is holographic, right? And then they print on the card, but they block out the holographic in some parts where you'll see like, oh, okay, like, Gohanks' hair is holographic, but his face isn't holographic. Mm -hmm. So that's the reverse holographic where they actually print a second layer behind it that blocks out the ink so that when the ink gets printed on it, you don't see the reflection of the hologram through that. Interesting. I think the way that they've developed that reverse holo technology in DBS is like so, so cool. Especially like the new Super Rares. Dude, they, I, though they don't have the, the texture foiling that the older Super Rares have, that I really like the texture foiling on those. Right. The, the, the advancement of the reverse hollow is insane. Yeah. Like if you look at the new secrets, they're not blocked out completely. There's a lot of gradients into the reverse hollow where it's like their hair will be part reverse hollow and then not reverse hollow. I'm gonna have to examine like my Kai secret or something because yeah. this is, I definitely never paid this much detail there, to it. There, there is some very, very advanced stuff going on. And what's really cool about that is like, that actually comes from the Japanese woodblock printing tradition. Hmm. So, have you ever seen that picture of the um, 
the like wave that like really famous japanese wave i think so like every kid has it in their room in college yeah i think i think i know what you're talking about yeah probably have a picture of it somewhere in here actually but it's uh that wave is it, it originally was a japanese woodblock print and the guy that um did that print his name was katsushika hokusai and it was from a series of prints called 36 views of mount fuji and uh that same guy was the guy that coined the term manga okay he wrote the first ever manga and it was a book of um it was a book of just pictures of things that were japanese he did one that was just facial expressions another was like tools and animals and just things that were japanese it was like a visual encyclopedia and he called it manga and that's where the word manga comes from so all manga is actually related to the japanese woodblock tradition in that way and you see a lot of techniques and styles um in different printing methods made in japan where they're referencing these things and that's i think one of the big things why bandai is so um vocal about the fact that everything's made in japan is because they are still using a lot of those techniques like the um when they do the secret rares the gold foiling that's actually printed at a different time than the card itself so the mm. card is printed and then the sheet is taken to another place where the gold foil is stamped and that's how you get that's why we're seeing these more like advanced foiling techniques because so they're pushing the foiling they're not as much pushing the texture which i think is really cool because again it, you know it references that amazing history within the culture yeah that's super interesting i never knew any of that to be honest and the uh... Like, I think the texture foiling, which we haven't seen in a little while, but I, I do think texture foiling is really incredible because, like, just put, putting your thumbs over, you know, like, a secret rare and, like, feeling the different ways, like, the card raises, like, almost, you know, kind of like a Braille-ish yeah, type of like, thing. it's like an experience in itself. It's uh, Yeah, it's really a, a really, really cool experience. And it, and it is, you know, it's not gone completely. I think just in the main block sets, we're not seeing it in the SPRs and the secret rares because I think they're pushing the gold foiling more, which... In a way, the gold foil itself, I think, makes things look more valuable because when we see gold, we associate that with value. Right. But we are still seeing like the, um, you know, the collector's selection. That was like crazy texture. Oh yeah, those cards are beautiful. Insane texturing and like, and then also in the special anniversary, I feel like they put a lot of energy into those also and, and doing the texturing in the same way. So I'm interested to see what the next, I think the next special anniversary comes out in September. Yeah, I think the, I think the the first two anniversaries have come out the same month, so they'll probably do the same one for uh, for this new one. Well, I think the first two came out in June. Yeah. In, it, it, but I think because things got pushed back so much from release sense. schedules, this one's coming out in September. Gotcha. But I'm curious to see what they'll do, and I really like in the in the special anniversary things how they. Um, how they bring back support for old archetypes. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I thought it was really cool that they made an archetype in the last one that was like pretty viable for a while. Um, what was it? The uh, AOD? AOD, yeah. Yeah. That was a cool list. It, was, it had like, and what was really cool about it for like beginners, it, I felt like it was a really cool deck because there's so many different mechanics that you get to see counterplays, you get to see negates, you get to see, you know, like searching for stuff and playing off of skills. So it's fun when they do stuff that makes make things accessible for new players yeah for sure and that, that one was actually interesting because like i believe if you bought like what one or two of the anniversary boxes you got a play set of all the aod stuff yeah. but then you had to pull the leader which is like 30 bucks so it's kind of funny yeah. how you have like the whole deck minus yeah. the leader right. but uh i mean yeah getting the leader wasn't too bad foil, right? yeah yeah but that, that that foiling was really nice on that leader yeah and I, I yeah I, there were so many cards in that set that just looked so cool and then the the reprints they do like that UI um, Unstoppable reprint. Oh, the four drop? Oh yeah, that card looks amazing. With, the, with like the, the kanji background, like yeah, it yeah. looks so good. Yeah, it's gonna need to turn into a t-shirt soon. All right, so your shorts are, are rolling through here, man. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna hem them now. Actually, I'll hem them last because I'll figure out the length on them. All right, let's, yeah, let's, what's the process going on here? We're, we're, getting, we're getting there, man, we're in there. I'm gonna put on the waistband. Got it all stitched together already, pretty much. Nice. Yeah, I, uh, how would you feel if a One Piece card game came out? 
I think it'd be sick. Apparently there was one. Um, yeah, I think there was one. Yeah, I mean, I, it was never on my radar until my friends pointed out more recently, but uh, I'd be cool. I mean, um, the thing with the Dragon Ball card game is like, I'm, I'm not married to the IP necessarily. And in, in the sense of like, if it was a different anime that I liked somewhat and the game was still this amazing, the game is what really draws me. It's, yeah. it's awesome that it's Dragon Ball, don't get me wrong. But like, if it was the same game with like One Piece or Naruto or uh, I don't know, some other, some other cool anime, I'd totally be game. Yeah, I mean, the IP is what got me into it, but um, the game is what makes me stay. Right. Sort of sure. like when people come to watch my shrippums, they come for the shrippums and stay for the dental tooth tips. Yeah, absolutely. Those tooth tips at the end are, are life changing. Literally, literally life betterment. <laughs> For free. Hey, people, yeah, people pay money for that stuff, man. You know, they really do. And 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 it's so easy to to um to take your teeth for granted. Yeah. You know? they, they're really valuable things, and it's not that hard to take care of them. But unfortunately, the business of dentistry, they you know, dentists profit off of people not really taking care of themselves, which kind of sucks. Yeah, it's a really interesting dilemma where. The, do the doctors are there to prevent the problems, but they also benefit when there are problems, right? It's really, really funny dilemma. I call it a shady business because we evaluate x-rays and x-rays technically are just projected shadows. <laughs> so it's kind of inherent. And there's the shade right there. You, guys, you show someone their x-ray, you're throwing shade at them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. Over the last year, what's been your favorite deck to play? My favorite deck to play over the last year. So that's pretty much COVID era, I guess we would say. Pretty much, yeah. Um, probably the Gohan Icarus deck that I was playing for a while. Um, that was a cool deck, man. It's super fun, yeah. It just uh, unfortunately got outclassed by Mecha, which is why I started playing Mecha towards the end of uh, set 13. But um, no, it was super fun. Like I found this kind of like niche thing where at the time, not a ton of people were playing Mecha. And Mecha's not even that bad of a matchup, but Dark Broly is a really bad matchup for that deck, which at that time was much more prevalent. Yeah. Um, but if I played against anything else that wasn't Dark Broly, I was a lot more confident. And it was just really cool because like the blue-yellow thing had not like popped off yet. Right. So the Bojack in that deck was a little bit more unique than it is now. And uh, the deck was just super cool, it was a lot of fun. I got to play uh, a very mid-rangey deck, and mid-range is like the way I want to play the game. So. Yeah, and it also was a completely original spice of your own. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely take some pride in saying it was pretty, pretty unique. Yeah. So I, I would have to say that like I think the most rewarding thing in this game for me is when I'm able to play a deck that isn't a deck that a lot of people are playing. Yeah. That can hang. Yeah, for sure. It doesn't have to be the best. It doesn't have to win against everything. But if it can hang against the things that are good, I'm proud of myself. And that feels really good. Yeah, I definitely feel that. It's definitely being being creative. You know, like you get that satisfaction from being creative. Um, yeah. And sometimes, like, a thing for me is, like, I'm not a big fan of, like, uh, tier zero formats or triangle formats, which you'll find people that are big fans of all three kinds. You have tier zero formats where only one deck is good. You got triangle formats where there's only three or four good decks. And then you have like really wide formats like we've been in for the past several months. Yeah, I really um, enjoy wide formats. Me too. And I think part of that for me is like not constantly playing mirror matches or not constantly playing against the same decks is a lot of fun. Uh, oh, is it time for me to put these on? Well, I want to check the length. Okay. I'm going to hem them. Let's see. But just hold them up to like your waist here. And let's see. That looks like about the right length. I'll just do a normal hem on there. Okay. I would say so. Yeah. All right, cool. Sweet. Yeah, I really like... Uh, like a more diverse format and i yeah. think um i think the reason why is because there's more things that become viable on a wider format right like in a in a, in a more narrowed format yeah they're like the, the choices of what to play may be more obvious but like mirror matches are not that fun right <laughs> yeah and doing it once in a while is cool like there are yeah. some mirror matches where like your skill is really tested. Like me and my friend Danny were playing Mecha Mirrors to test for the for the Massachusetts, oh, yeah. the Massachusetts and the uh, Connecticut regionals, and then we had to we actually had to play the mirror match at the Massachusetts regional, and uh, it just like it was a really crazy just like outplay fest where we just had to go back and forth, back and yeah. forth. And it's like I feel like in that matchup you just are waiting for your opponent to slip. Kind of, yeah, in a way, which. Kind of happened, I guess. I, I played against him, and uh, it was really funny. Like, he double bergamoed me to tap all four of my energy, 
but I still had my Awaken. Oh, and he also Final Flashed my Bojack, so my Bojack was dead, like couldn't use his ability. And uh, yeah, it was definitely, <laughs> definitely sounds like you're about to lose, but then uh, I still had my Awaken, so I Awakened, got my blue yellow back, used three Sensu Beans, used the power of a Super Saiyan, then I double Bergamot him back and his turn was over. So like, it was just like, it was an insane like interaction. Yeah, but that's like, that's the overextension. Yeah. Right, is like, I, you know, you know Miguel, right? Yeah. Um, Miguel, Miguel is my sensei. I, uh, I, since I, since I started playing with him, I feel like my skill cap has really gone up a lot more. Yeah, he's a super good player. He's, a, he's an amazing player. And what's so cool about the way that he plays is it's like, he takes a card that you think you know what it does, and then you watch him do something with it, and it somehow does like three more things. <laughs> And you're like, what? Yeah, How pull, you pull a value out of the card. Yeah, yeah, like literally he's extracting every bit of value out of the card. And it's really cool to watch the way that he sequences stuff. And um, one of the things he told me that since I've really been focusing on this when I play more, that I think um, is really cool. It's from uh, this book called The Art of War, actually, which is like a famous, you know, old... Yeah, I heard of it, yeah. And um, he was like don't play to beat your opponent play to let your opponent beat themselves and it's a really valid thing because of the over the capacity to overextend in this yeah. game and how appealing it can be when you're like i have energy i have cards i can play them right and then the question is if you if you're not stopping to ask the question, do I push? More often than not, you're going to die. Right. But if you at least stop and ask that question and evaluate your resources, right? Like in the game, we were just jamming upstairs. Like the question was, do I push? And the answer was, I have to, because if I don't, I die on the next turn. Right. Right. And if you aren't able to identify, okay, am I going to die? Or do I have the ability to make it through the next turn? And if I can make it through the next turn and I, and I feel confident that I can, then my opponent is going to be that many resources fewer on their following turn and then i can push and then i can win yeah it also comes down to like a mind game thing too right like um i was just coaching a, a player the other day and um we were we were going through a game and i forget the exact scenario but essentially what happened was we were playing against this, this random person online on, on untap and our hand was not looking super great but you know we were we were pushing because we kind of had to at this point and our opponent used a counterplay like a lot earlier than we thought they should, but we hadn't overwhelmed yet in that turn. So they're probably thinking like, oh, he's got the overwhelm. I gotta like play for it, this and that. Um, when in reality, we didn't have it. But but being the opponent, you kind of have to think, oh, they must have it, right? So you play that kind of mind game thing and it can work out for you nine times out of 10 if you, yeah. if you play it correctly. Yeah, and, and people will just beat themselves. Yeah. They'll beat themselves because they think that, you know, this is the... They, that they that the game's over. I've had I've sat I've been sitting at an event, and um, and somebody will ask me if I have a card in my hand. They're like, oh well, do you have this card in your hand? I'll be like, yeah. And they'll be like, show it to me, and I'll show them the card, and they'll scoop. But what they don't know is that I don't have all the other cards to set that card up. Right, right. Right, like that card doesn't win the game. It's a bunch of cards that win the game. And it right. doesn't, just because I have that card doesn't mean I have the other cards. Now, there may be a chance I'm going to draw into it with the things that I have, but like a lot of times people will just say like, oh, do you have this card? It's over, right? And if they're in that position and I'm in an event, I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. If I'm at locals, I'm going to be like, no, don't do it. Like, let's play the game because I'm not going to win. But if I'm at a, a big event, like I'm going to take that W, dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if your opponent's ready, ready to concede, there, there actually is a skill to like knowing when to concede a game that you just can't win. Yeah, and it absolutely. saves time and prevents going into overtime and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I do that very, very rarely, like super rarely. Unless like I know for without a shadow of a doubt, I cannot possibly win this game. Um. I, you know, I, I know that there is a, um, there's like a component of sportsmanship that goes into that also. You know, it's like knock over your king when you know the game's over kind right, of thing. Right, right. But at the same time, like, I really like Dragon Ball, and my favorite things in Dragon Ball are like when they're doing these these last fights that are like the massive destruction of landscape. And like, even though I'm gonna lose at that point, a lot of times I'm like, dude, bring it on. Yeah, let's, I let's just see, see how it goes. Happens. Yeah, like how big can this attack get? You know, that's the cool part about the game. 
And a lot of times, like, when somebody scoops, it's like, man, like, I don't even get to do the fun thing, you know? Like, I know you hate catastrophic blow, but I wanted to tap the energy, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? no, I get that. Catastrophic but, blow, though, definitely is a different, is a different ball game. Yeah, it's card's a little frustrating. It's a little frustrating. <laughs> but it's pretty funny. There's, uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of games that I've won, like... You know, you just at a, at a certain point, your opponent's in one life. You got to drop your hand on the attack, the final attack. But you think like, oh, my combo power is so minuscule. Like I'm never, and they just have like ten cards in the hand they can't combo with. And I'm yeah. just like, well, like yeah. that's that's why a good reason why you should always just go to the last uh, the last point. Oh boy, it even comes with its own little knapsack. Yeah, check this out. Watch All right, you you should, do I don't want to rip anything. Like, sure. Roll for the party, and you're like, I got my pants. Oh snap. That's a pocket actually. Holy crap, that's awesome. So uh yeah, if you wanna like go upstairs and throw those on, feel free to throw those on. Let's do it. We'll... And then we'll continue the So in in Joku's pants episode one, I mean I'd call it a success. I think it was pretty successful. I got you in my pants. Shorts. But pants Close enough, it's summer yeah, after all. Summer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shorts, pants. It's reasonable. I don't think I've ever seen you wearing pants. Long pants, probably maybe at an event or two, but uh, yeah, I mean, shorts are maybe way more comfortable. In the summer, like it's very rare you catch me in sneakers, like unless I'm going somewhere. But flip flops, some nice comfortable shorts like these, Perfect. a nice chill shirt like this, this is awesome. This is so and, sweet. And if you ever go to a third world country, I can show you a little trick. Say like you don't want anybody to steal your staple gun. Instead of putting it in your pocket like this, you can actually pull your pocket out, and then you can take your staple gun and you can put it inside your pants into the pocket from the inside. That's a good trick. I'm just waiting for you to staple your leg. And then you can take your staple gun in your pocket and you can tuck it in your waistband and nobody's stealing that. That's the trick. That's staying in there. So, you know, these pants are, they're, they're versatile. It's my original design. And I got you in them now. I am definitely, I'm very happy to be in them. <laughs> what, a pleasure, what a pleasure to be in these pants. <laughs> um, well, Joey, thanks for coming over and hanging out. And, Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've really enjoyed, you know, I, you're, you're somebody that I've looked up to for a long time in the community and really had a lot of respect for what you have to say. I think you have a really rational perspective on a healthy game state that is something that creates a lot of accessibility for a lot of players to, to join in on. So it's been really cool to be able to talk about this stuff with you. And, um, you know, I, I really think it's a matter of time when it comes to this game. I think uh, I think that the proportion of people that are fans of Dragon Ball that don't know about the Dragon Ball Super Card game is much greater relative to the number of people that say know about Pokemon and know about the card game. So right. I think, you know, as more Dragon Ball games become more popular and there's more things that uh, pick up more momentum, I think it's only going to be a matter of time before everybody that knows about Dragon Ball and knows about this game. And it's probably not going to be anytime really soon, but I think in the next couple of years, I mean, the game's young, man. It's really young. Four years. Yeah, coming up on four years. Uh, I definitely think the anime will help a lot, new movies, stuff like that. Um, it's really nice that I've been hearing that there's been a lot of um, advertisement for the game in like Dokkan Battle, Legends, stuff like that, which is nice. Yeah, I mean, the, the more exposure for the game is, is great. And I think I think Bandai probably could do a little more in terms of, like, you know, their outlets for, for advertising and whatnot. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can as content creators and yeah, pushing the game because we love the game, you know? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's what we can do. And, and creating a, a sort of a, a guide for the people that are watching that is like, hey, like, what are you interested in? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to divert your attention? Like, that is the as much content as we can produce there's always going to be more to be consumed we right can never produce enough for everybody to consume the amount they want to consume so i think it's kind of on us to get together like this and do stuff together and create bridges within the content creator community which i think bandai is recognizing also by doing stuff like the ser showdown and showing that like hey we're all on the same team here yeah we're on the dragon ball team yep and the goal is just grow it right and uh and the more accessible this come becomes to a wider variety a group of people the more people that are going to get into it because the reality is like you know a competitive scene is not going to develop everywhere where everybody wants these cards but the cards are gorgeous right and if the, if bandai is going to put energy into either making the cards gorgeous or promoting the game i'd rather they keep making the cards gorgeous and and we'll pick up the slack
Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a zero sum game, but I do, I do right. know you. I do, I do know what you mean. It's like, not a zero sum game. Probably. Right. Like, I do there are things that can be done, which is why I gave you the Dragon Ball Legends Cup. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Pr cross promoting. <laughs> But, but yeah, no, I mean, they could definitely do more. And, you know, they're, they're very receptive to feedback. So I think yeah. that's good. You know, there's always that open door of communication, which is nice. It is really cool because uh, I, I find that in a lot of games, you really don't find that. It's a lot more driven by trying to sell the product. And though they are trying to sell the product, of course, I think the product almost sells itself in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, you, go to, you go to a store, you're a Dragon Ball fanboy, you see it on the shelves, yeah, grab it. Totally. And, and, the, um, and the people that are, you know, fans of the show, like there's so many more collectors than there are players. Yeah, and that's something that I think that's good for them to capitalize on, and uh, and you know, I'll keep shripping them, and you keep uh, telling me how to play the game. I like that combination. I'll do some more shrips now that I know the technique. You know nice. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, this definitely won't be the last time that we do this. Um, I want to say thanks to uh, the Joe Crew and the the Dragon Ballers. Thank you guys all so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for watching the show. Uh, we had a really great time. I, you know, as as much as I would like to to say that I do this all for the community. I really do love the community. I think it's a really awesome community and I appreciate everybody that takes the time to uh, watch these shows, but I just really love stripping cards and I really love hanging out with friends and talking about stuff. So this is a really rewarding thing for me to do. And Absolutely. At the end of the day, on some levels it is selfish, but to those of you that do enjoy uh, watching me explore my selfish behaviors, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the day. Thank you guys. Make sure to subscribe to Joku. And yes, Joku, thank you for the pants, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Don't forget to check out Crossworld TCG if you guys want to learn some competitive stuff about the game. Joey has some amazing content. And of course, a big shout out to Steve for making this movie. Thanks, Steve. We love you, Steve. Thanks, Steve.